Oh, hey, Chris. How was the uh, colonoscopy? Oh, brutal, man. I, I don't know, something snapped off and it's just hurting. Yikes. Sorry about that. Hey, you know how some dogs sort of look like their owners? What if case makers share the same traits as their cases? That's ridiculous. No, it kind of works, right? I mean, because like the Pure Bay 600 is cool, right? And, and you're arguably cool, right? Hmm. The case is super quiet, and you've always been on the soft-spoken side. Yeah, yeah, I was... See? It's totally true. Actually, there's one more thing we have in common. What's that? Well, after the colonoscopy, I think I also support a 360 millimeter radiator. Does that, like, include push-pull, or...? The Pure Bay 600 from Be Quiet offers a tempered glass side panel, sound damping material, and a highly versatile design. Ships with a pair of powerful Pure Wings 2 fans and intentional support for 360 radiators. Click the link in the description for more info. What's cracking, people? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all doing well. Today, we are building a full-blown system from the ground up. The objective of this build is going to be so that, theoretically, those of you who might be building a system of your own at home can assemble it almost in real time as you watch me build mine. And so this is really just to help those of you who are maybe new to PC building, if it's your first time, or if you just need a refresher on how to assemble this stuff. Um, so hopefully that's, that, that makes sense, and uh, it's going to be a lengthier video because of that. It's just more of a, a casual and relaxed environment to teach users or new users how to build a PC. I will say that even if you're not building a Ryzen system, so I'm building an AMD Ryzen PC, even if you're building an Intel-based computer, you can still apply 95% of what I'm going to be doing today to your system. It doesn't really matter. The only real differences are the CPU installation, which is a breeze on either platform, and CPU cooler installation, which in itself can vary greatly even on the same platform depending on which manufacturer of cooler you're going with. So, that being said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what is, what, am I just building this computer just for you guys? No, of course not. This is actually going to be my cousin's gaming PC uh, that I helped him assemble or that I, that I helped him uh, pick out the parts for. I actually did a video, you can go ahead and check that out, where I sort of uh, make a parts list and that parts list looks drastically different from the hardware you see before me because I went back to the drawing board several times and was like, no, that doesn't make sense. That's stupid. So I've swapped it out from, it was originally going to be an Intel system, uh, and now it's AMD Ryzen. What do you know? It just seemed to make more sense with his budget and stuff. For those of you curious, the, the build we're looking at today is around $1,200 MSRP, you know, give or take 100 bucks or so, depending on the prices, how they fluctuate all the time and stuff. But let's go ahead and go over the parts, shall we? One by one, I'm going to do it really quick because we've got a lot of building to do right afterwards. So first off, our CPU of the hour is the Ryzen 5 1600. It's a six core, 12 thread part, uh, boosts up to 3.6 gigahertz. I am going to try to push that a bit further with a manual overclock for Brandon. He's not into overclocking. He's not too familiar with it. So I'm going to try to get the, squeeze the most performance uh, out of it as I can um, with the help of this cooler. Now this was originally the, the cooler that Brandon bought and paid for is this one right here. This is the Cryorig H7, a really great price to performance cooler. However, I forgot to tell Brandon to also pick up or order an AM4 bracket to go along with it because it doesn't come with one. So it's not supported with Ryzen natively out of the box. So uh, it's gonna take probably a few weeks for that bracket to get here. So in the meantime, we're using this Noctua uh, NE, no, NH um, U12S. Fantastic cooler. Brandon can decide if he wants to keep this one or swap it out for the H7 once the bracket arrives and that sort of thing. So that's that, that takes care of that. We've also got a B350 Tomahawk motherboard from MSI. This is a fantastic little budget board. I believe that this is one of the ones that has a PLX chip, so it supports Crossfire and all that jazz. It's a, it's a really nice, sort of a black and red color scheme. Actually, the red is very subtle on the VRM heat sinks. Um, probably shouldn't clash with anything else in the rig, but a uh, fantastic little board here that is going to be paired with the GTX 1070 Super Clock Edition from good old EVGA. This is still, I think, one of the more affordable 1070s that you can find on the market. Um, however, it's a blazing fast card, and it's certainly going to kick ass and uh, raid some frames for today's system. Uh, the memory kit, I almost forgot about that down there. Uh, it's a 18, no, it's, I'm sorry, the 16 gigabyte kit. Where'd you get that 18 gigabyte kit from? Uh, 16 gig kit of G-Skill Ripjaws 5 DDR4 
at 3000 megahertz, I am also going to try to overclock that to 3200 as that does help uh, Ryzen in gaming performance some. Uh, hopefully the B350 Tomahawk here is able to handle that. Our storage configuration consists of two drives, the first of which being a 250 gig WD Blue. That's actually an SSD, not a mechanical hard drive like you might have thought at first. Um, yeah, WD makes, makes freaking SSDs now and they actually call them the same name as their mechanical drives, which is super confusing. But uh, nonetheless, this should be a pretty sweet uh, SSD. I've never used it before personally or tested it. Um, so hopefully it's uh, it works and it's fast enough. And we've got a one terabyte WD Black mechanical hard drive for his uh, for all the games and stuff. Obviously, the heavy storage needs um, media, that sort of thing. I should mention that we are installing Windows 10 64-bit on that SSD as well. We've got the Seasonic G Series 650 watt power supply. This is a modular unit and 80 plus gold certified, yo. So incredibly power efficient. Um, and it's also, uh, what was I gonna say? It's a CC, oh, Seasonic. Seasonic is a great power supply brand. They are very reputable. Um, so hopefully this one will handle this, uh, th this particular system just fine. And then finally, our case of the hour is the NZXT S340 Elite in white. I gave uh, Brandon a couple options. He really wanted a white case, so I gave him this one along with like three or four other uh, popular white cases. And this is the one he came out with, was like, this is the one, this one right here. And I completely agree. I love this case myself. I've built uh, a couple systems in it already. It's got a beautiful tempered glass side panel. It's got radiator support at the front in case he wants to upgrade the cooling solution later down the line. And it's just a really nice, uh, chassis for not too much money. Uh, and then finally, just to give ourselves a little bit of a, an aesthetic bump for the rig, I have included some uh, Fantex uh, white sleeved extension cables to make things look nice and pretty. Oh, there's one more thing. Um, as a thank you to Brandon for letting me build his rig and film it on the channel, I am throwing in, free of charge, an NZXT Hue Plus RGB LED unit, which is probably the biggest, baddest, most awesome RGB accessory you can add to a system here in 2017. So that's gonna definitely spice things up and add some bling. Definitely gonna give us a bling factor for today's build. But those are all the parts, ladies and gentlemen. So I've, I'm done rambling. I'm gonna go ahead and start building. Uh, so if you guys, those of you who are building your own systems at home right now, what I'm gonna suggest is that you grab your CPU, AKA your uh, desktop processor, and your main board or your motherboard, uh, because that's generally where I like to start in any in a, in a given build. So um, let's let's start there. All right, y'all. So you can see that I've taken the CPU somewhat out of its packaging. You want to make sure not to touch it unless you absolutely have to. So it's still sort of in a little box for now. But I've also removed the motherboard from its uh, anti-static sleeve. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of other stuff on this table. I'm going to go over everything. Uh, but when you take your motherboard out of its box. Uh, you want to also take out a few important accessories along with it so that they're just on hand when you're ready for them. Uh, the first of which is your motherboard I.O. shield, and we're going to see what this exactly is for in just a bit. As well as your SATA cables, I would take out a number of SATA cables equivalent to the number of 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch drives that you'll be connecting to your system. So in our instance, we've got two drives, one SSD and one mechanical hard drive. So I've actually pulled out all four of the cables since they come connected. Uh, but you can take those out as well. And then your, your motherboard manual. So this is the Tomahawk manual. Um, you might need to consult it at some point. And then the other stuff on here, these are just sort of like tools that I use when building a computer. The only one you absolutely need, well, let me get the CPU out of here. That's not a tool really. Uh, so we've got our, the one you really need is a, a screwdriver. You need a Phillips head screwdriver. This is a number two Phillips head screwdriver. Um, any sort of length will do, but I generally prefer a slightly longer one. Woohoo! Uh, just to make it a little bit easy when screwing in screws and stuff. But a uh, magnetic tip also helps a lot. Not, not required, but definitely appreciated. Makes things a bit easier. And then we've also got some cable management accessories here. So zip ties. Generally, uh, there's at least one, one or two components in your uh, build that will come with zip ties, but they're usually very few of them and they're not like the right length or they're too cheap and stuff like that. So I have my own on hand. Again, this is not necessary, just kind of creates a cleaner build uh, for the cable management part. And then I've got some Velcro ties in case I need them. Uh, and then of course some wire cutters to cut the zip ties and stuff. Uh, a pair of scissors also works just as fine. Don't use a knife, that could be dangerous. So those are the things that we are gonna be using for this build. And on that note, we can actually install our CPU. All right, so here's a close-up look at our CPU socket. And this is basically where the CPU gets physically mounted or inserted on the motherboard. 
and this one in particular is the AM4 socket. AM4 is only compatible with uh, AMD Ryzen CPUs, at least at the time of filming. So don't try, don't bother putting in a in a non Ryzen AMD chip or an Intel chip. God forbid, bad things will happen if you do. So just stick to Ryzen for AM4, and you'll be good to go. So if you are building an Intel rig right now, I would suggest going to some sort of tutorial. Maybe I'll link one. I'll put a card somewhere if I can find a good tutorial on how to do that um, on the Intel platform. But for ZIF sockets for Ryzen. It's really quite simple. All you do is lift up this bar here. There's a little little bar that's got a little latch. You kind of got to push it to the side a little bit and then lift it up like so. And then get your CPU out. I will remind you guys not to leave any fingerprints on your CPU, particularly on the top. You don't want to touch this top heat spreader here. That's a, that's a no-no. You want to grab it from the sides. So here here's the CPU, all right? You can grab the edges. Edges are fine. Also, do not touch the golden contacts, the golden pins, I should say, on the bottom. All right, that's a no-no as well. That's very important. You wanna keep that as clean as possible. The way you wanna do this now is you wanna take note of the golden triangle. There's a golden triangle on one of the corners of the CPU. And you wanna match that with the small, tiny ass triangle in the corner of the socket. You can see there's a tiny little corner, or I'm sorry, yeah, a little arrow right in the corner there that's gonna match up with the gold arrow on your CPU. So the way you wanna do this is grab it with uh, one hand, one finger on each side. I, I use my thumb and my index, and you just go straight down into the socket. You'll notice that uh, the pins, you have pins on the bottom and you have pin holes in the socket. So obviously you're gonna be slotting all those pins into all those holes, and it should just drop down. It, it should feel snug, it should feel like it's, it's in there and uh, you can give it a little wiggle to make sure that it's fully down. Looks good. And then you take the lever and you just push it back to where it was. There will be a little bit of pressure. Don't let it scare you though. And once it locks, once the lever locks back into place, voila, you've just installed a CPU. Now some CPUs, including the one that we're using today, come included with a stock cooler. And uh, this one in particular comes with the AMD Wraith Spire, which is a fantastic stock cooler, but we're using something a little bit better. We're using that Noctua cooler that I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the video. So we actually don't need these mounting bars. These mounting bars on either side of the socket, those are for the, uh, for the stock cooler, but we don't need those. We wanna make way for the Noctua cooler bracket. So we're gonna actually remove these by unscrewing each of the screws. There's two screws on either side. And upon removing them, the mounting bracket should pop off just like that. Do the same thing for the other side. So we are gonna to wanna to keep the AM4 backplate in place because that's how we're gonna mount our third party air cooler here. And this is where things get a little tricky because there's no standard method for install installing uh, CPU coolers. It all sort of differs based on the manufacturer. Uh, this Noctua cooler installation will be vastly different than uh, an NZXT cooler versus a Thermaltake cooler versus uh, a Fantex cooler, a Corsair cooler, and so forth. So this is really the only part in the build where I'm gonna have to leave you guys on your own, I promise. Uh, so at this point, I want you to consult the manual that came with your air cooler or liquid cooler and follow it to a T. Follow the instructions there and, uh, and you should be good to go. Make sure that you're also following the instructions in that manual that pertain to your particular socket. So again, we're, we're running a AM4 right here. If you're using LGA 1155 with Intel or LGA 2011, um, then you wanna make sure that you're reading the right instructions for that socket. Um, but before I let you go and, and off to your own installation, with the cooler, I will teach you how to apply thermal paste. And it's fairly simple. Thermal paste is basically a thermal interface material that basically is a heat conductor between the heat spreader of the CPU and the base plate of your cooler. It basically allows for heat transfer between your CPU and the cooler so that uh, you get better absorption, better dissipation, and uh, superior thermals. If you don't use thermal paste, you're gonna have a bad day. You always, always, always want to use a proper application of thermal paste. So what you want to do, I have a little plunger here. Yours probably looks a little similar. Um, I like to do the grain of rice method. So straight in the middle, it's just how it sounds. You want a grain of rice size of thermal paste. You can go a little bit bigger. I would say grain of rice works for uh, LGA 1151, for example, and similar because it's a smaller chip and um, you don't really need that much. Ryzen's slightly bigger of a heat spreader. So we're gonna, we're gonna do the, uh, the green pea method 
the green pea method is slightly bigger than the grain of rice. Bada bing, bada boom. Beautiful. All right. And ideally, the, the theory here is that once you push this thing down, once you smack it down on the CPU, it's just going to spread it um, across the entire heat spreader. And so you'll, you'll actually get much fuller coverage than what it looks like right now. So on that note, why don't you go ahead and install your CPU cooler while I install mine, and we'll, uh, we'll meet back afterwards. Sound good? All right, go for it. Good luck. I believe in you. All right, moving on to the memory. So installing the memory is one of the easier parts about building a PC, but there are a couple things to be aware of. The first of which is that you have these four DIMM slots, at least on this motherboard, there are four DIMM slots uh, that you would actually populate and they can actually be covered or blocked if you have too big of an air CPU cooler. Uh, now this one is, is fairly slim, so we're not running into any clearance issues, but you might have one that's too large and kind of encroaching on these leftmost uh, CPU, or I'm sorry, DIMM slots, and that could be an issue. Hopefully if, you, if yours is only encroached because there's a fan on the side, you should be able to pop the fan off and it'll give you more open access to those DIMM slots and then you can go ahead and install your memory modules. Um, but if you are just running into some issues and there's no way around it, it's possible that you've just got some incompatible RAM that is just too tall. The heat spreader is on the RAM, which is the, the black enclosure that you see here, for example, is just too tall for the model of CPU cooler that you've purchased. You might wanna look into that online, do some research to make sure that it is incompatible before you like send things back and stuff, but that can occur from time to time. Assuming though that you don't have any clearance issues and that you have uh, a free, fr free access to all these DIMM slots, you wanna consult your motherboard manual to, uh, to find out which of these slots should be populated with your modules, because it does matter. It does matter. No matter if you have one stick or four sticks or eight sticks, uh, you want to make sure that you're putting them in the right slots. And the only really way, the only way to find that out is through the manual. So once you've done that, I've already found out that mine, uh, my, my two sticks that I have here should be going in the second and the fourth slot. So I've got that all figured out. So the next thing I want to do to actually install these suckers is I want to pull down these side latches. There's side latches on uh, in this instance, there's side latches on both sides of each DIMM slot. Some other boards, some other boards only have a, a fold down latch on one side and the other one is fixed. So if that applies to you. Don't, don't try to force uh, one of the sides down. It's probably just not meant to move. But in this case, both of them uh, fold down on either side. Now, before you install these suckers, you wanna make note of the little notch that's the bottom of the module. You can see it right there. Um, it's off center, which means that these are keyed PCBs, which means they can only go in a certain way. So you want to match that notch up with the notch that's in the dim slot itself, just to ensure that you're plugging it in the right way. Otherwise, you could damage the module. So once you've got that figured out, go ahead and line it up and applying equal pressure on both sides of the stick. You want to apply force downward until both of those side latches that you popped down earlier snap back into place. So we just did the first one. Let's do it again for this guy. Even pressure downward and voila. You can see that the latches, all four of the latches are completely upright um, where they were before. So memory installation complete, very straightforward and simple. Let's move on to the next step. All right, we've got our case now. So go ahead and get your case out of the box. Be careful with it, especially if you, you've got something like a tempered glass side panel. It can be very fragile. And what we need to do is sort of prep our case so that we can fit our now prepped motherboard snugly inside of it. So I'm going to go ahead and take off this side panel. Now, if you guys have a more conventional side panel that's not tempered glass, you probably have, you probably don't have these four thumb screws directly on the side. You probably have two thumb screws on the back or something similar, depending on the case. So go ahead and remove the side panel carefully. Be especially careful. I mean, whether or not you have tempered glass, you should still be careful if you have, if you have like an acrylic side panel window or something like that, because they can scratch very easily. I would advise leaving the plastic wrap on uh, the, uh, the side panel window until you're absolutely done 100% complete with the build. I know it's tempting. I know it's tempting to, to peel it off the second you see it and go, ooh, ah, but uh, trust me, you'll thank me later. It's not worth it. Now I'm also gonna remove the back side panel and you guys should too, just in case you find any accessories back there. 
A lot of times case vendors like to put the accessories inside of the case. They like to hide them either in the drive cage or in the power supply shroud somewhere. So go ahead and take your accessories out. You will be needing them very soon. In fact, right now. Let's go ahead and put the case on its side so that the, the main side is facing up and the back side is facing down. Boom. And here's where you want to bust out your motherboard IO shield that I told you to remove from your motherboard box earlier. Take it out of the plastic wrapping. Like so. It's like an ASMR video now. Ugh. And you want to make sure that you line this up properly. Generally, the shiny side, if there's a shiny side, is going to face inside, in, inward of your case. And the really nice outside, uh, or the really nice part is going to be outside, obviously, because you can see it. Um, and the way this goes, so you already know it's going to go either this way or this way, right? With the, with the shiny side inside. Um, now it's just a matter of which way does that go. Um, you can just line it up with your motherboard, or I can just tell you a rule of thumb, where you see the little circles, all the little audio circles, that's going to go on the bottom, towards the bottom of the case. Uh, that's pretty much the best way to tell. And then uh, just go ahead and pop it in. Now, this can be a little tricky. It's hard to know once you pop this in, and it's sort of, you have, to, you have to kind of do it by feel and by sound. So you hear that? That that was part of it popping in. And you want to just double check. You have to look really closely to make sure that the entire perimeter of your IO shield is flush. So you just want to double check, push it firmly around the edges, make sure it's all good in there. All right, now before you get too excited and go about installing your motherboard, uh, there's a couple things to mention here. Um, first of which, if you are using an air CPU cooler tower sort of thing, like, like I am right here, then this doesn't really apply to you. But for those of you using liquid-cooled AIOs of any kind that have radiators and things like that, uh, you want to make a note uh, of whether or not it makes sense to install your motherboard first before you install your radiator. It can kind of depend. For the most part, I would say the rule of thumb is you install your motherboard first and then your radiator, but there are some instances where the reverse is true and makes more sense for that particular configuration. So you just want to sort of think it through. Um, if you're not sure, maybe just look up in, in certain manuals to see what they suggest, or if it's not there, look online. But that is something to point out. The other important thing to note before you install your motherboard is that you have your motherboard standoffs installed. Now, NZXT has already done us the solid of pre-installing these, and these are these little metal pegs that are sticking out of the motherboard tray that give your motherboard a little bit of lift. It kind of prevents the, the, the trace layouts on the back of your motherboard um, making contact with the steel surface of the case itself to prevent any sort of shortages and things like that. So it's very important that you have these in place. Um, again, NZXT's already put them here. And if you're lucky, you'll actually get uh, one in the middle, a peg in the middle that's uh, get a little bit, it's got a little bit of a tit on it, a little bit of a lift off. It's a little bit taller than the other ones. It looks a little different than the other guys. And that's just so that you can uh, have something to latch onto. There's a, you know, obviously a hole in the middle of your motherboard that will latch onto that middle peg when you're putting it into place and just sort of lock it and freeze it so that it's easier to work with and more stable. It's not moving around and stuff. It's really nice to have one of those. But if you don't, no worries, you can still get by. Uh, now, the other thing to, to be aware of is that not all standoffs should be in the same place for every situation. For example, these are in the ATX configuration for ATX uh, motherboards, which I in fact have right now. So that's good. So I don't need to change anything here. But let's say you were building for some reason with a micro ATX motherboard uh, and you needed to rearrange the um, standoffs to accommodate that particular form factor. Uh, you can either look in your case manual or if it's not there, it could be etched directly onto the motherboard tray where here it says, you know, micro ATX, ATX, ITX, and it gives you sort of a legend and you can figure out where uh, the standoffs go for that particular form factor board. Now then, we can go ahead and mount our motherboard now that that's all out of the way. And I like to grab the motherboard by either side. I really try my best not to grab it by the CPU cooler. That's a bad habit of mine, I know, I need to stop. And then I just sort of uh, just push it in there, just gently. I like to look at the back of the motherboard, or behind the, tr the case, so I can align the I.O., the rear I.O., with the I.O. shield. And then if all goes well, the middle peg, the lifted peg, will latch on, and... Voila. The motherboard's not installed yet. Don't put the case upright. It'll just probably fall out and something will break. Uh, we still need to screw it down. So we've got some screws here. You're going to want to get the accessories out that came with your case, with your chassis. And then um, with your 
hopefully metallic uh, tip screwdriver. This is where the metallic tip really comes in handy. Uh, you're just gonna go ahead and screw those down. Uh, I should mention, when you're installing the standoffs, the standoffs underneath, um, you wanna make sure to tighten them, but you don't wanna over tighten them because they can strip and then they'll just like do the infinite spin. And that's not good because then these screws won't really go in at all. Um, and then likewise, when you're screwing in these screws, you wanna make them snug, but not too snug. Again, because you could strip them and if you tighten, if you over tighten them, then uh, removing them, when you remove them, you might actually pull out a standoff or the, the standoff might um, come along with it. And that can be a pain sometimes to, uh, to work around that. So you can expect with a standard ATX motherboard that you'll have to do you have to input about eight or nine of these screws. Uh, we only have to do eight because the middle standoff is, uh, is a raised one. But if yours is not raised and it looks like all the other ones, then you will have to put a ninth screw right there. And voila, now we can say our motherboard is properly installed. We can put the case up if we wanted to, uh, which we're gonna actually need to do now to install the power supply. All right, so I've got my power supply here, and sure enough, it is partially modular, which means you have some of the essentials that are just wired, hardwired into the power supply, and the accessories, or the uh, peripheral cables, if you will, are separate. So you could plug these in as you, as you see fit, depending on what devices you want connected, which is really nice, helps clean up cable management a bit, because you're only connecting the, the cables that you need, instead of everything and trying to find a place for the ones that you aren't using. So um, I've kind of already figured out which ones I need. Uh, the ones that are connected are the, the standard essentials that most people will be using anyway, uh, which is your 24 pin ATX. This goes uh, to your motherboard directly as does the uh, eight pin EPS. This is the, the, uh, the, uh, the CPU connector. And then we've also got one for PCI Express. This is for your video card. Uh, we've actually got two uh, eight pin connectors. These are six plus two pin design, you can see that they kind of split off and this is going to be plenty for our video card. So we don't need to add additional PCIe uh, cables to this guy. What we do need are our peripheral cables. So uh, we need some SATA cables here, both for our uh, two drives. We, we do have an SSD and a mechanical hard drive that are SATA. Uh, they use SATA connectors. So we're gonna need um, to power them with this SATA plug. You can see that there's actually one, two, three, four SATA connectors on this one cable. So hopefully if we wire things properly uh, and this cable is long enough, we'll be able to wire both of those hard drives with one cable. Two birds with one stone, so to speak. And then we've got one more of those. This is uh, another SATA cable, exactly the same as SATA, SATA power um, that uh, is actually a little bit shorter and there's only two connectors on this one. And this is gonna be going to our NZXT Hue Plus. You may have other SATA enabled devices that, um, that, that need to be powered, such as, let's say, a built-in fan controller into your case. Or there's Molex as well. Molex is a completely different um, plug that uh, did come included. Uh, we do have some Molex cables included with this power supply, but we don't have any Molex um, devices that are in this system, so we don't need to use those. Uh, the other thing is, uh, with the matter of which way do you want to install the power supply, I generally say face down, especially with cases now having ventilation slots at the bottom with dust filters as this one does. Uh, if it doesn't, if your case does not have any sort of ventilation at the bottom here where the power supply mount is, then I would say flip it up top. Otherwise, I would, I would go, would go to the bottom. Um, now, this is a bit of a unique layout. Actually, there's, there's plenty of c cases that do this, but the S340 Elite actually has this bracket on the back with uh, removable thumb screws, which you still, for some reason, need a screwdriver to remove. That's silly. Um, and this is what you want to attach to the power supply first before you install it. There, uh, I would say most cases do not use this method. Most cases you just slot the power supply in. Oh, that's the wrong way. You would just put the power supply in and then you would just directly screw in four screws into the existing holes. But this is a little bit different. NZXT is getting all clever with it. So I'm gonna get my power supply screws that came included with the case. Um, I think you might also get some screws that come with your power supply, but more often than not, they're gonna come with your case. So we're just gonna mount this guy on here. Alrighty, okay. Now then, before we install the power supply, I'm going to connect all the cables that I need right now, because it's a lot easier that way to connect them outside of the case than it is to try to 
finagle them inside once the power supply is already installed. First SATA cable, and you want to make sure that you're plugging it in. It's all labeled, so it says PCIe, that's for our graphics cards, the CPU, obviously, and then peripheral IDE slash SATA, which is what we want. That's the one we want right there. So you can just pop that sucker in and do the same thing for our other one. Boom. Okie dokie. So then now, what I like to do is sort of group the cables together and push them through the back side of the power supply mounting area and just slot it in like that and screw her down. Now some cases will have you mount the power supply from behind the motherboard tray this way. I'll just have you slot it in from this side as opposed to behind the case. But uh, every case is a little bit different. So again, check your motherboard, or I'm sorry, your case manual for details. All right, that looks good for now. Uh, we're gonna leave the power supply cables as is for now. We're gonna move on to something else. Let's do the front panel connectors. Oh, how exciting. So here's a look behind your motherboard tray. And for starters, you can see our power supply that we literally just installed with all the cables coming from it. But then you've got this whole other mess of cables that seems to be stemming from the front of your case, apart from these two. These are, these are fan cables, we'll talk about that later. Uh, and these are your front panel connectors coming from the front. Everything that's at the front of your case, including the power button, reset button, power and hard drive LEDs, USB ports, audio jacks, etc. That all needs to get wired to your motherboard one way or another. And that's, uh, that's what these cables are for. So each one represents a different thing. You've got your USB 3.0, which is the big blue one. USB 2.0, which is labeled. And the, these really tiny ones, these are really tiny ones and make up your, uh, your hard drive and power LEDs, uh, your reset button, power button, etc. And then you've got uh, special things that pertain to only some cases like your, your HDMI port here. Uh, if you're into VR, and an HD audio for your um, 3.5 millimeter headphone and microphone jacks. Um, so yeah, we've got these to plug in. We're gonna have to flip the case around so that we can start uh, wiring these guys correctly to their appropriate headers. All right, so we're on the other side of the case now. You can see I've already routed all of my front panel connectors through the various cutouts in the case. Now I did this strategically. I didn't just pick any old cutout and stick a cable through. I actually routed each cable through the cutout closest to its appropriate header, which is why the HD audio connector, or the HD audio plug, is right next to the HD audio connector on the motherboard, the USB 3.0 connector is right next to the USB 3 header on the motherboard, and so forth. So, that makes it really easy for plugging and chugging, plugging things in. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start with the USB 3.0. Now, the, the USB 3.0, in fact, all of these, except for the, the, the really tiny cables, uh, really tiny connectors um, are keyed. So you wanna make sure that you're plugging it in them in the right way, or you're gonna have a bad day, break some pins. I have broken many a USB 3.0 pin before, so I am a little nervous right now. There we go. USB 3 is secured. Moving on to the little guys. We'll move on to the little guys. The little guys, so we've got power, power LED, and hard drive LED. Um, the one that's the common one that's missing here that the S340 Elite does not have is the reset uh, button, but that's okay. We're gonna find, we're gonna locate it on the motherboard. It's right here for this particular board. You're gonna have to look it up in your motherboard manual. Each board's different as to where these little guys go. Um, actually, sometimes it's printed. Oftentimes it'll be printed somewhere on the motherboard telling you where the pins go, and in this case we do we do see that. Power switch is plus and minus that way. If you're not sure which way is plus or minus on the switches, I believe it's the, uh, you'll see a little arrow indicating, indicating plus, the positive. Side with the no arrow is the ground. And then we've got the hard drive. Hard drive LED, which is right there on the bottom. Underneath, uh, this could be a pain. There we go. All right, little bastards are all plugged in. We can move on to our USB 2.0, which is right next door. This is also keyed as I mentioned. And if one of these pins snaps off on any of these headers, 
you're pretty screwed. Oh, also, by the way, for the USB 3.0, I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm sorry. If your motherboard has two of those ports, it looks like you could plug it in either or. See how this one also has a USB 3 port down there? Um, they are effectively identical, so it really doesn't matter which one you plug it into, just whichever one is more convenient or what have you. And then this is the HD audio. There she blows. There she blows. Front panel connectors are installed, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and do the fans next. I'd like to start with the little wires first, and then we can work our way up to the big kahunas, like our 24-pin ATX and uh, PCIe after we install the video card and stuff. So, fans. All right. Fans, actually, we don't even have to cut right here. Um, you'll notice that there are no fans at the front of the case, which is kind of odd, and that's by design because NZXT is expecting the user to install an AIO at the front of the case, which comes already with, a, with, with fans. So... Since, it, since we're not using an AIO, we're using a uh, air cooler, not a liquid cooler, we are gonna install two additional fans for my cousin. So I've got actually two NZXT fans. These are from my, uh, my other NZXT case. These are 120 millimeters. Uh, they're exactly identical as the existing fans in the case. So we're gonna install them at the front as intakes. And to do that, we first have to pop off the front panel of this case you just pull it like that. Not every case will have the front panel pop off so easily. Some of them have latches that need to be undone and so forth. So let's just install these guys. Let's, uh, there's a little cable, a little cable cut out here. Can you guys even see what I'm doing? Yeah, you can. Where my fan screws at? All right, we've got direct airflow now going straight to the CPU cooler and soon to be the video card, which we're gonna pop right there. And now we shall route all of the fan cables to the various fan headers on the motherboard. We should first locate where those headers are. There's one here, there's one here, and we got two up here. And then the fifth one is actually being populated already by the CPU cooler here, this fan. So uh, you wanna approach wiring your fans the exact same way as you wired your front panel connectors. Route them through the, the cutout that makes the most sense nearest to the header you wish to plug them into. And generally, if, uh, if you're dealing with a, a decent case, there'll be a cutout at the very top, a couple cutouts if you're lucky, which is perfect for these top mounted fan headers because they just kind of stay out of sight, out of mind. And this bottom one here, I think I'm gonna connect the back fan because it seems the closest. Sorry, I know you guys can't see anything because my fat fingers are in the way. There's really no other way to do this though. Okie dokie, fans are plugged in. Next up, we are installing our hard drive. And uh, this is a three and a half inch drive, of course. We are gonna install it in the only three and a half inch drive cage in this case. And uh, every, every case is a little bit different where the mounting points exactly are. Uh, go ahead and consult your case manual for those specifications and then once you know what you're doing you can just pop in the drive or you know there's there's different mounting solutions some of them have little uh like wing brackets that fold out the sides other ones you just screw them in like this heck yeah going old school you'll notice that there are three threads on either side of a three and a half inch mechanical drive for the most part you're gonna want to screw all those down. Don't skimp. Don't think like, oh, I only need to put two in. No, put that third one in because there are moving parts in a hard drive, yo. And those moving parts, like a like a needle and a platter and a little 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 green man. There's a little green man in every hard drive. No, there's really not. And if your hard drive's not mounted properly and securely in your case, then all those moving parts can end up making lots of vibration and noise, which is quite unsettling. Make sure you do your job and screw them all in. Now this is a unfortunate design. I should have thought to plug the, or screw this in earlier. There's only one screw hole here on this side. Uh, the case only gives you one screw hole. So I'm screwing it in with my hand which is not good. I'm gonna get a smaller screwdriver. I have a little screwdriver head here. That's really the only thing that I could fit inside of this tight space. Woo! Is just the tip. Woo! -hoo. And it should get it tight enough, though. Woo! All right, there's our hard drive. Look at him. He's so cute. He's all secure and mounted and stuff. Hey, what is this? What is this? What is this right here? 
This looks awfully familiar. This almost looks like that one SATA cable that we had plugged into our power supply from earlier. Oh my lord, it is. And it is also, it's the same L shape. My goodness, so you want to line that up and just push it in. Just nice and easy. Oh yeah, right there. That, that is firm. That is real firm. SATA power has been connected, but wait, there's more. You need data. So let's, let's get a, a data cable. Remember the other accessory that I told you to get out from your motherboard box way back at the beginning of the video? Yeah, it's time. It's time to whip one of those out, if you know what I mean. So we're gonna get one of these. Now these are, these have two different connectors or two different ends. Um, you could get flat, you can get flat on both sides or you can get one flat and one right angle. It just depends on what the manufacturer has given you. Usually they give you two of each. And uh, generally if, you, if you're using the right angle, I like to save that for the drive itself as long as it makes sense to do so. So that looks pretty good. And then the other end just goes into one of the SATA ports that's on your motherboard. Let's, uh, I'll cut to a B-roll shot of that. Now, a couple quick things to note about the SATA data cable before we move on. First of which is that you will hear an audible click once you've inserted it far enough into the port, letting you know that you've established a secure connection. You can even tug on it, it won't budge unless you push down on the metal latch, only then will it release. The other thing is, how do you know which of these ports to plug into? I mean, they all look the same, but if you consult your motherboard manual, it will tell you which of these ports are wired to the native chipset on board, this one being B350, and which ports are wired or controlled by a third-party add-on controller. Add-on controller is good to have, but if it's, it shouldn't be your first choice. You should always opt for the native chipset on your motherboard. In this case, all four of these ports are natively controlled by B350, so it doesn't really matter which ones we go with. But if you were to connect, let's say, an SSD in particular, it doesn't really matter for hard drives too much, but I'd still recommend native chipset anyway. Um, if for, for sure an SSD, you want to be, be sure that it's plugged into ports controlled by the native chipset. Otherwise, you could incur a bit of a slowdown in certain situations. So just to be safe, native chipset, check the motherboard manual. Good, okay. You know what, while we're here, why don't we just stick in another one? So she said, for our SSD that we're about to install, yo. Sounds pretty good to me. All right, I don't like the way that looks. I'm gonna do it flat like the other one. It will be creeping up behind him. All right, here we go. Beautiful. Okay, uh, now we gotta install our SSD. All right, so as I've been saying throughout this video, every case is a little bit different, and that means you don't know. I don't know where you're gonna be mounting your SSD to. I don't know if it's gonna be above a power supply shroud like this one, if it's gonna be behind the motherboard tray, maybe in a drive cage somewhere at the front. You just, you just don't know with SSDs these days. They're just so darn small, they can fit pretty much anywhere. So case manufacturers have come up with so many clever options for mounting them in different places. But uh, consult, once again, your case manual to find out where you should place your SSD. Oftentimes they give you more than one choice as to where you want to mount it. Uh, I, would, I would mount it in the best place. That would be my recommendation. And there are four threads at the bottom of every SSD. There's also threads on either side of the SSD, so depending on the case maker, that will determine where you're screwing things in. In this case, obviously, we're doing it from the bottom. I like it better on bottom, personally. Oh, by the way, I took the sticker off the SSD already because it was hideous. Oh, you know what? This is an important lesson. Um, before you mount your SSD, you might want to think about plugging it in first with your SATA and data cables, if it makes sense. Again use it as a case-by-case -case sort of suggestion. But um, in this particular situation, it does make sense to connect the cables first before mounting it down because the port is hard to get to once the drive is mounted flat against the chassis. So I've got one cable for you here. There's the data. And now, we give it power. When I say power, that you're supposed to come out when I say power. You ruined it. So let's go ahead and mount this just the same as we did with our hard drive. You might need to bend the cables a bit. 
need to flex him a bit just to just to get him to play nicely sometimes. Look at my forearm. Ugh, working that out. Yeah, I've been I've been screwing a lot lately. I don't even mean that in like a dirty way. I've been using the screwdrivers very frequently. Uh, let's see. Why don't we mount the uh, the Hue Plus over here? You know, oh shit. I should have mounted the Hue Plus here because it's a little bit bigger. I don't want a big fat thing in the middle. I'm gonna swap it. I'm swapping it. I don't care. So the Hue Plus is also two and a half inch form factor, although it's kind of a, a fatty, a fatty form factor because it's like 30 times as thick as this thing. Get down, get down onto the power supply shroud. Thumb screw, thumb screw, thumb screw. So this is the Hue Plus. This is the the brain, if you will, that controls all the various effects and colors, blah de blah de blah. And this particular kit comes included with some strips that you can attach to the brain. LED strips, that is. Voila. So I realize that this part of the build doesn't apply to most of you because most of you aren't building with the Hue Plus. However, you can check out my video on the Hue Plus if you want more info on it. Uh, for now, I'm just going to go ahead and take care of this, but we're going to skip it for the purpose of this video and move on to the next part. All right, guys, now we're plugging in our meaty connectors. They're not really called meaty connectors. They're just uh, the, the bigger plugs, uh, certainly much bigger than the front panel connectors or the fan headers. Um, so starting with the 24-pin uh, the ATX. This is our supplemental motherboard power connector and it's the it's the big one it's the big fat chunky one it's hard to miss 24 pins if you want to count them just to be sure and you'll notice that there's a clip on one side and no clip on the other all right remember that clip because there will be a little edge sticking out a little uh, latch on one side of the connector so the clip will go on that side so yes these are keyed they will only go in that one way sorry my hands are in the way Oh boy. Boom. All right. It's plugged in. Next up, we've got our 8 pin CPU connector. And this looks like two cables, but it's actually just one and it splits off into two. The part, the, the end that splits off into two is the part you want to plug into your motherboard. Sometimes when it's split, you'll actually have a little mechanism to lock the two halves into place so they stay together, like so. And then the header on the motherboard that you plug this into is typically located in the top left corner right there. So you just got to feel around for it. This one, this uh, port here can be a pain, especially if you don't have much room. And hopefully I remember to put an annotation when I was talking about installing water cooling radiators that sometimes it's best to install your power supply first and then your motherboard and then plug in this gosh darn cable before you install your radiator because sometimes the radiator if you're mounting it at the top of the case can easily block your 8 pin cable that's good though there's a, a cutout at the top of the case fortunately thank you NZXT for that just route it right through oh there's there's our LED strip falling down uh, and then BAM next up we've got our PCIe extensions for our graphics card but we don't have a graphics card installed yet so we should do that first all right, and moving on to our last component for today, which is the graphics card. Woo, we made it. Very exciting stuff, and this is a really straightforward installation. The first thing you want to do is consult your motherboard manual and find out which of these PCIe by 16 slots you should be populating. Typically, it's the top slot, but you want to check the manual just to be safe. And uh, what you want to do first is lower the latch that's at the end of the slot you wish to populate. And then uh, once you do that, that actually kind of opens it up for access. And then you need to remove some expansion slots. And, and the number of expansion slots you need to remove depends on how wide your card slot width is. So this is a two slot card. You can see it's, it's got two rows, two of these little rows here. Um, you can look up the specs, the official specs on the manufacturer's website just to be safe. So you're going to remove, since we have a two slot card here, we need to remove two expansion slots. The first one being the one that's just adjacent to the, the slot itself. And then since uh, we're going to need room below that, we have to remove the, uh, the expansion slot beneath that first one. So very simple process here. You're going to want to undo the thumb screws in the, in the S340 Elite here. There's actually a, like a, a second panel or there's like a, a big panel that you have to remove first in order to access the thumb screws. So I'm going to go ahead and do that first. Most cases don't have this. So that's one less little step you have to worry about. All right. So that panel's gone and then you just remove the two thumb screws that you need to 
access their, their uh, expansion slots there. Aha! Look at that. All right. Beautiful. So now we have room for the video card. We're going to go ahead and just hold it gently. And you want to just sort of line it up with the uh, with the slot. And you'll see that there's actually a notch. You'll see there's a notch in the video card um, connector. And there's that should line up with the notch in the motherboard slot. And very much like your memory, you'll hear a nice click. A very satisfying and noticeable click. And then you just go ahead and screw the thumb screws back in. You want to make sure that they're fairly tight. You don't want to over tighten, but make them snug. Now this plate back on. And finally, you want to connect your PCIe connector. Very, very similar in how we connected our 8-pin EPS uh, CPU connector and our 24-pin. Um, it is keyed. There's a clip on one side and also a, a latch on one side of the connector of the, uh, the video card itself. You want to line those up. And if you're rocking a, uh, a similar plug like this where it's a 6 plus 2 design, then you want to make sure that those are sort of connected. There's, there's a little bit of a, a ledge at the bottom at the base of the, the plug itself, and you want to make sure that that is flush before you plug it in. If you do it all correctly, it'll go in like so. And then, uh, and then you want to route this, obviously, through the best possible grommet. You could route it through this right here, this, this sort of sidebar, at least for the S340. Um, or it could go down below into the basement, but I kind of like it behind just makes it a little bit more discreet. It's all a matter of preference on how you like the look. Okay, and then obviously you always want to make sure that all the plastic wrap that comes on your fresh products is removed before operation. You don't want any of this stuff getting too hot. These computer parts can get really toasty. You don't want melted plastic in your rig. All right, I think that's good. I think we're good. I think on that note, we just got to take care of some cable management, which is on the back side, and we will be completely done with my cousin's PC. And hopefully you'll be done with yours too. So where do you even begin with something like this? This is pretty intimidating if it's your first time or you're not too familiar with how to do this, um, but it, it really is quite straightforward. And honestly, guys, I've, I've done, uh, this is sort of an old video, but I have a in-depth uh, video on cable management. So you can go check that out for even more detail than I'm going to give here. This is going to be more high level, but essentially you have to see at first what you have to work with in your case. So this one in particular has a huge basement. There's just like this huge enclosure that goes uh, over the power supply and the drive cage, and you could just stash a bunch of cables down here and it wouldn't be visible on the other side whatsoever, which is your beauty side. You want that side to look nice. This side, more or less, it doesn't matter as much. It's kind of a personal preference thing. Um, but for me, since I have this nice basement to work with, I am gonna be taking advantage of that and stuffing a lot of cables in there, being a little bit lazy, but hey, if it's, if it's there for a reason, I'm gonna use it. Uh, now, for those of you who don't have a nice big basement to stash a bunch of cables in, uh, you probably just have to do it the old school way and sort of uh, tie down, you have to group together cables, all right? You have to find out what makes sense when you bunch them up, all right? Which, which cables can be bunched together and using zip ties in tandem with the tie down points that are around your motherboard tray, should you have them, is always a good idea that keeps the cables really flat and up close against the motherboard tray so that you can fit your side panel on once you're all done. Uh, the other thing that this case has that not many do are these little cable clasps. This is not actually very common on most cases these days, but uh, it is it is very handy. I'm going to be using these as well to aid in my my cable quest. You obviously, want to make sure to connect your extensions, all the extensions that you've used, to their appropriate cables coming from the power supply. Otherwise, your components won't work. So fortunately, thanks to NZXT's brilliant cable clasps here. Uh, I don't really need to use many zip ties at all, but I will use it for our 8-pin CPU connector here, since uh, it's sort of off in right field. Once you're done with your zip tie, you can go ahead and snip it off with your wire cutters or scissors, whichever one. And we didn't even have to use any Velcro straps because um, just the cable management in this case is super boss. But there you guys have it. There's cable management, pretty much done. Again. Like 90% of this was just shoving stuff into the into the basement. 
but um, but hey, it works, and it's not too difficult to to redo or rewire things or service it in there if we absolutely need to. But hey, holy crap, uh, our, our, our build is done. That's a horrible angle. Let me go ahead and change things up for you so you can see what it looks like all powered on. All right, guys, so I discovered the audio clip for this outro was actually corrupted after I sent the rig home with my cousin, so I got to do this lame voiceover while you watch me turn the system on for the first time, but technical catastrophes aside, the build was a success. The rig posted just fine and seems to be in healthy working condition, so hopefully those of you building at home find yourselves in the same boat and you're now ready for Windows installation or whatever operating system you choose to go with. I'm sorry if this video didn't have the same amount of polish as some of my other content because it was just really long and kind of difficult to edit, but I hope it helped you along with your own build and leaves you with a new sense of confidence and appreciation when assembling a PC. So if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to toss me a like on it before you go and feel free to subscribe to the channel for more tech stuff on the way. Have a good one, guys. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all in the next one.